It's my honour today to talk with Mr. Graham Smith, um, formerly of Second Squadron SAS, who served three tours of duty in Vietnam between 1966 and 1972 during the height of this Cold War conflict. So, Graham, thank you for agreeing to um, share your experiences. It's a great privilege to hear from you and to learn from you and, uh, and all, the, all those experiences you had. The first couple of questions I had was about the early days of Graham Smith growing up and what was it like growing up for you and where did you get the interest in the military and want to, to join the Australian well, Army? I was born in Brisbane. Uh, my family has had a, a fairly long history with the Australian military both in the First and Second War. I uh, attended Brisbane Grammar School and I joined the Cadet Corps there oh, yeah. and became part of the Brisbane Grammar Rifle Team. That's oh, always right. been an interest of mine. Yeah. Uh, I th- when I finished school, I then uh, sort of drifted around and did this and that. And I was particularly perturbed after the Long Tan Battle a number of the people there who were killed, I, who I knew of, who were people came from around our oh, right. suburb in Brisbane. Okay. And I thought, well, I better have a go at this. So I decided, that, and I was in the army ten days later, and that's where my full time military service. Okay. Started what age from. were you when you when you joined up? Twenty two. Twenty two. Okay. So you didn't come straight out of school. You went. No. You had a couple of years knocking about. So the family experience, there's a family background there in the cadets at Brisbane Grammar, would have had a long tradition in the cadet yeah. cadet corps there, and then you knew some people. I did. So what was that suburb, just out of interest? In Annerley. Uh, Annerley, yeah. No worries, no worries. So then you joined the Army, and what made you want to go into the SAS regiment? Well, I'd had a fairly strong history, uh, interest in military history, and I thought, if you're going to do it, you better go and do it properly, where yeah. at least you've got some control yeah. over the outcome and the people you will be serving with are on a fairly similar yeah. uh, plane. Yeah. It was the early days for the Special Air Services Regiment back in in the 1960s. You joined around 1964, is that correct? No, I, I joined the regiment in 1966. Oh, 66, yeah. But two squadron had been deployed to Borneo in 1964. Okay. Uh, followed by the various other squadrons on their deployment to yeah. Vietnam, carrying on from there. Yeah. When I was living in Western Australia, I met a SAS a veteran who had been in Borneo, Malaya. You know, it was a, lo- a lot of it wasn't really spoken about was behind the lines type of stuff and he was he was told that, you know, you these fellas you could come across, these Indonesians won't be very well equipped and all this stuff and and he comes along a jungle trail and finds this Indonesian with an A K forty seven he's in he's better equipped than I bloody was. They were. They had him sixteens long before we really? had them. They did. Goodness gracious. And they had some very high quality Units, uh, the RPKAD and the Corps Commando we were in, which were the naval commandos, okay. were very highly trained and had travelled to various military schools in the States and yeah. wherever else to, for their parachuting requirements and development. So they'd built up a fairly decent defence force after they gained very independence. Much so. Yeah. Well, Sukarno probably was around at that time, was he? He was, yeah. yeah. So, um, so you decided to join the SAS regiment early early days of it, and um, what was the training like? I understood there were two instructors who had served in World War Two. We had two members of the regiment who had served in World War Two. Most of the other people had served in Korea or with oh. Australian Army training team, yeah. or in Malaya, yeah. and and in Borneo. So those people training you had had a lot of. They serious did. experience. I mean, obviously, Korea sometimes was a forgotten war, yeah. but Australia was heavily involved in there. Very much some, so. some really tough situations around them. Um, I forget it was around a big reservoir or whatever, but it was freezing cold and massive withdrawal. And yeah, that's correct. You know all about it because you're so good mm-hmm. on the military history. But um, what was what was the training like and the selection? The selection 
is probably very similar to today. Okay. It was very intense, demanding, and you became very tired. Yeah. Which caused your decision making yeah. to become a bit blurred at yeah. times. Yeah. And that's the whole secret was to keep one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And do it one step at a time because if you thought too far ahead, you could confuse the whole issue because you were given small command roles, everybody, and would be to have to do some task or another or some yeah. something like that. And even with everybody trying to uh, help one another to get through, that was one of the first things. Yeah. that came out, you become a group of your own. Yeah. And I think that was the intention to do so. Knit you together. Yeah, it was it was still quite difficult and by the time that was it was over you knew you knew what you'd been through. Yeah. Yeah. But getting in was probably the easy part. Yeah. Staying in. <laughs> and the people who stay there for twenty years, the uh the psychological and the physical demands would be extraordinary yeah. on a man of, yeah. of 40, 40 odd. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're a trainer, I suppose you had to keep pretty sharp with your own physical Well, they did. Fitness. You had to do what everybody else did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with those two gentlemen from World War II, did they have specific areas that they trained you on? No, not really. One was the base squadron commander. With a, with, he was a, a former commando squadron member with a military medal. Wow. And the other chap, he was a, a North African veteran. Wow. Was a warrant officer in the in the Q complex. So when he, this other gentleman was in the commandos, that in when it was the army commandos or more towards the... Yeah, World the War Two. Yeah. Because it's interesting when you look at the origins of the SAS and the, and the commandos influenced it and... Um, there were some raids that the commandos suffered high losses and they came mm. in with, with large numbers and then there was raids in North Africa. I think they had high losses. One might, have, oh, one might have been in Barrier or whatever. They had some high losses and then they said, well, we, we're going to try smaller units with Sterling and Lewis mm. and bring them down like to 12 men units. And that seemed to be part of the secret of the success as opposed to 500, a regiment size to... Yeah. Just the small, and it's still the same with the SAS well, it today. Is still and the the same, yeah. That small units. Um, when you were doing your, your training, obviously the training kept going and kept going. And nowadays I understand that people might specialise in communications or demolition or that, medics. That, that came as part, once the basic training or the, the Carter course had been completed. And the people that we had running the Carter course were all Vietnam veterans from the, particularly the time I went through from three squadron. Ah, oh, okay. So you were getting on the job training about how the job should be done. It, it wasn't any fanciful thing about this may or this may not. Yeah. They would say this will and that won't and okay. you must. So three squadron were were, all, were over there before you went yeah. with two squadron. Yeah. And what was their was their role similar to what you did, or were they more in? They were quite a similar role. Yeah. One of the interesting things that came from that, they saw cart marks or wheel marks, and uh -huh. nobody really knew what they were from. Like when, and they turned out that they were Goronov medium Russian machine guns. Oh that were mounted on wheels. Ah, okay. And they'd seen those before the long tan action, but nobody really had is any that, indication what they were. Ah, it's like the, is that the German, uh, the Russian copy of a Maxim machine gun with the, the no, shield on it? No, it? it was a different one. Ah, with the 12.7? It was a light, no, it was a 7.62 air-cooled ah. machine gun. Right on, they drag it on little sled. Yeah. Gosh. So um, that's a little bit on your on your training. Um, what was the toughest thing of the training and the going through selection for you? I think just keeping going. Just keeping going. Because you didn't get much sleep. Yeah, yeah. One of the things you hear on 
you read about the selection in the current ASS is they have um, an an account interrogation type situation that they set them up on towards the end and they reckon that's where they try and really break people a little bit. Well, I, if I had an opinion on that, I would say that it would be very little merit in doing that because you'll either be killed or they'll do a job on you that minor interrogation, yeah. like to pull your fingernails out as an introduction. That there yeah, would be yeah. nothing genteel no. about it whatsoever. Obviously, Special Forces, Commandos, SAS, they um, they get special treatment if they are ever captured. That's tends oh, to be historical. Um, it wouldn't happen. Obviously, I think Hitler in the Second World War said that Commandos were to be shot out of, out of hand. And they were. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it was a... I think it was just a general conception of one in all in, one out all out. Yeah. You never would leave anybody behind. Yeah. Under no. any circumstances. No, no, it's cl- um, for it's, sure. It's a bond that develops that you'd be closer to anybody you'll ever be in your life, let yeah. alone your family. Yeah. And be you have far to... far deeper bond. Yeah, you, you're in that cauldron in, in difficult circumstances, even in your training and selection, that tends it to is. form the connection. Obviously, that's before you even discuss yeah. what combat will do to people because you're relying on those folk. So um, what was it like when you got to Vietnam? What was the first impressions? I, 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 don't, think you're, you're, um, I don't know what age you were when you got there, maybe 23. 23, to, I 23. was, yeah. So, yeah. Well, when we flew into Tonsonite, we basically did a crash landing because they were still fighting around the, air, around the airport and at the Tonsonite race course. So we were escorted down by two Cobra gunships escorted us down Wow. To land. Wow. And when you got out the back, there were holes in buildings and piles of cartridge cases and goodness knows what else. And you could so where was this airport and what did you fly in on? Well, we, we f- oh, I think it was a Qantas plane we flew <laughs> up on. Okay. That was into Tonsonite, which is uh, the major Saigon okay. airport, yeah. excuse me. And then, so you, you arrive, it's this cartridge cases, pock marks and buildings. Yeah. And you, 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 and there was a big hole with an RPG had shot in the post office, <laughs> which opened your eyes up a bit. But yes, the old RPG. So then you arrive there and it's, it's a bit, bit bit different, a bit strange, but you backed your, you obviously you got well trained, you're with your well, comrades. Well, we then flew up you know, by Caribou to uh, Luscombe Field at, at Newey Dad. Yep. And then we were taken by vehicle up to the squadron allocated area and given give an appropriate tentage combination, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, tents to... Bivouacs or whatever. Bivouacs that you were allocated to yep. and where the, we had a number of sandbag defensive positions yep. around the place and... So far, how far out from Nui Dat was this? Like Nui Dat was the main centre of yeah. Australian operations. So were you in country a bit from that? Uh, we were right in the middle. Oh, really? Yeah. So well, back over towards the La- Laotian border up to... No, no, I was in, in Phuc Thuy province, but where oh, the yeah. SAS builder uh, was called SAS Hill, which was a, a, a prominent okay. feature yeah. in our, our barracks or... Arrangements were around that. Okay, when sometimes when you look at the map of Vietnam, you realise with the topographical map that there was quite hilly country. Is that there was hilly country? There was also relatively flat country. Yeah, there was jungle and what they call savanna forest. Okay, so it depends on where the rainforest was or yeah wherever it it varied. So it was varying, topo- varying conditions. Yeah. You could be in a paddy field and in the Mekong Delta or it's very swampy and then you could be up in the, yeah, hi- like the hill country. Quite high. Did you ever um, interact with the hill, the, the hill people? No. That, that, was, that was mainly the Americans kind of worked yeah. with them. Yeah. Yeah, they apparently were pretty good fighters in that. Oh, movie. they were. And they suffered from being yeah. left behind. Yeah. Yeah, a bit like the Kurds yeah. in um, in the common in the more modern era. So um, so you get you you deploy you you fly in caribou as you mentioned that 
Right. And, you know, going out to the Army avi- Aviation Base, I look at those caribous and they're such a legendary And they aircraft. did such a magnificent job. Yeah. Without and, doubt. And it seems like only recent years that they've been decommissioned and I don't know what else they've got in to replace them, but they could. They were a tough aircraft. They'd take a lot of beating by yeah. whatever they had. Yeah, but you would spend a bit of time with them probably. Yeah, I'll be travelled around in it. Yeah. Actually half the dry, when we went to the parachute school, half the jumps we made were out of caribou's, the other half were out of Hercules. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got a bit of a soft spot for them actually. The caribou's? Yeah. Yeah, they're they're amazing aircraft and so many people had you know, just said they were indestructible, they could keep going forever. I think they were de Havilland, were they? I'm not sure. Yeah. So um can you go through some of the key operational deployments you were in and give us an exa- an, an understanding of the operational tempo? Like in current era, the story here is the SS were used so much, the guys were, you know, Well, we worked on a premise of five days in and five days out. Yeah. And th- once that tempo started, that was it. There would be people, unless there was a a squadron get together for something other you wouldn't see for 12 months because they're on a different time frame Gee. and deployment wow. to you. And we had three basic operations. One was reconnaissance. Yep. Another one was ambush. Yep. And another one was trail watch. Okay. Where you'd be allocated to a specific area to see if there was any movement along that particular yep. trail, whereas a reconnaissance was more, you would be given a nine grid square allocated area where you would cover that in whatever media, any methodology yep. you chose to do. Some of those included targets of opportunity where if you mm. found a likely target, you could ambush it. Yep. And in some cases, the ambush was a specific task to go yeah. to find a location and lay up an ambush for X amount of time till it either went off or you decided it had no potential. So when you would have encounters, and undoubtedly you did, with the amount of yeah. like it's fairly offensive operations that you're going out there, you're, you're going out to search for the enemy and observe, was it... NVA, North Vietnamese regulars, or Viet well, it was Cong, a, combination. a combination? We had local force, main force, which was a, a fairly high quality Viet Cong unit. Ah, okay. NVA units, 33 NVA was a, a one that was around 67 sappy unit. Yep. And there were local guerrillas. Uh, Village level, yeah, and sort of district level, yeah. So the sappers were supposed to be pretty, pretty competent. The sappers, the North Vietnamese had a parachute brigade. Really, it was disbanded and broken into two. One, but yeah. one became sappers. Yeah, the other half became counter reconnaissance troop units. Right, probably trained by the Chinese. Yeah. Or help trained by the Chinese and yep. the Russians. Yep. And they were extensively employed in Laos to prevent American reconnaissance units operating yep. in, the, in the country. So that the, they didn't want the Yanks to come in and find their supply lines coming down. Well, that was the Ho Chi Minh Trail, yep. and they were trying to prevent any incursions yep. to stop it to yeah, it's funny limit you, traffic. You talk, you know, the origins of the SAS regiment. They were trying to stop the supplies for yeah. the Messerschmitt M109s in North Africa. It was mainly to get the supplies, and a lot of the North African campaign was to stop them getting fuel and yeah. oil into North Africa. Exactly. And I suppose that was Vietnam too. There was so well, much was. to try and counter that supply line into the Ho Chi Minh Trail and the B-52 bombing. Well, and they were the eyes and ears there, and to a great degree... I suppose we were the eyes and ears yeah. of where we were. Yeah. One of the things you see in the movies and um, it's just the amount of booby traps and all these type of things, you, you just never knew when... No, you, they were very uh, good with them. 
Yeah, yeah. It was. Um, and Out- you- outstanding they were with the use of booby traps and yeah. how effective. Yeah. They were considering the cost. Yeah. But I suppose it, that that's the thing. I suppose when you're out there on patrol and you're at your five days out, you never really get a chance to drop your guard. If you drop your guard, you you're in. You know. You can't drop your guard. You don't even sleep much. You think you're sleeping of a night, but all you. Generally in speaking, unless you're a terribly cold fish, any noise or anything you have to be alert that for you it. have to hear. If yeah. you hear a tiger call in the night, nobody has to tell you what it is. <laughs> really? It's right back to caveman and your yeah. hair stands on end. Yeah, and the instincts come in. And you know what it is and it can see 20 times better in the dark than you can. Wow. I have to worry about tigers as well. Yeah, there were tigers there, <laughs> leopards. Yeah. And leopards. Yeah, not that we had much of a... In actuality, the the NBA had a lot of people killed by tigers travelling down through the central highlands. Really? Obviously, they may have been wounded or yeah. whatever. Wow. And they were very wary of them. Really? Mm. Gosh. And then you had the snakes. Was it the famous two-step snake or yeah, something? There was plenty of snakes. Yeah. And see, and all of that as well as the NBA... People from a local hamlet, um, Viet Cong, different levels of Viet Cong. So you had all that out there, and you just had no idea what you'd what you'd come well, across. One of the interesting things, if you camped in the bamboo, the spiky bamboo, the snakes had come down out of the bamboo in the dark. Oh yeah. And you could hear them hit the ground, plump. Okay. Plump, and you knew there was the snakes coming. <laughs> so what did you do then? Just stay really still. <laughs> you just still? had to stay where you were. <laughs> That'd be very hard for an Irishman. I think he'd, he'd be running. I think if he see, if he heard that pl- thing dropping out of the thing. So, when you'd go out for five days, what was a typical unit size that you you you'd take out on that? Patrol? Five. So five men, five days, five days back. Yeah. So would when you when you'd go out in the trail, would some would one guy go point a bit? Would you? W- yeah, it worked as a, in a, a linear formation. Yeah. In a uh, in a line, when you halted, you halted in a. In a circle, yeah. You slept in a circle, yeah. You crapped in the circle, yeah. You didn't go outside, yeah. That ring, yeah. And before you stopped, you would travel forward, say fifty meters in front, fifty meters on either side, to ensure that there were no tracks or anything within Kiwi or where you're going to stop, and you'd try and get into the thickest. Bit of scrub you could get into. Yes, of course you didn't want to leave tracks for the, the if they had these guys that were counter surveillance. They're yeah. looking for you, and you're looking for them. Well, that's right. So you had to. So the the um, there was a name that the SAS and the Australian SAS it was Ma Dong. Is that Ma it? Rung. Ma Rung, and that meant the ghost warriors, as they called it. It means the phantoms of the jungle. Phantoms of or the, the jungle. ghosts of the jungle. Yeah. And um, the Vietnamese weren't really happy with them. Um, they didn't like us very no, much. No, the um, this the I guess anyone who served in the second squad and the SS there and the SS in general can hold their head up high because they were very effective from it all was accounts. Very effective, and no no real combat casualties to speak of. We had none. We had the highest casualty to kill rate in the Vietnam War. Mm. That was the SAS regiment and was 520 for none. Yeah. And uh, it'd probably be twice that if you took and died of wounds, killed by air, yeah. killed by artillery. Yeah. So if you look at the US military, the number of rounds they expended for each killed in action was something like 25,000 or something incredible. I would, say, number. I would say so. <laughs> so I don't think... So you guys might have had a bit of a, a, bit of a higher success rate than that. Well, the, the, the thing... I would say is that in ninety nine percent nine percent of the cases we had the advantage. Yeah, well, that's and that was it. That doesn't come by luck, though. No, but the amount of firepower that an SAS patrol could put out at point blank range was mind boggling. Okay. Okay. In most cases, you had probably two M sixteens and three SLRs. The SLRs had 30 round magazines okay. on them and with an automatic capability. Yeah. And 
those bullets at that range would go through trees, anything, yeah. people, yeah. several people, yeah, and and the shock would have just been. Yeah. You couldn't you couldn't explain it because they didn't know what was going to happen. Didn't know how many were there, probably. No, and then that was the chance for you to get away because you couldn't stay. 